My name is Dennis Barber from Washington University in St. Louis. And I'd like to begin by laying out uh, generally what the structure of the next two hours should look like. I'll spend a few minutes introducing the symposium itself. I'll then um, present my presentation and then transition to the other presenters. We have not a, a time break in the middle, but we have a demonstration that's going to occur during the time interval of this symposium. If you navigate to this location, we'll put this link in the Zoom chat as well. You'll have multiple opportunities to navigate to this location. There is an online uh, data acquisition uh, system that you can explore. You can give your data into this, this uh, screening hearing test. And then at the end, uh, again, there's no time break here because we don't have the ability to adjust the starting times. We know there are other sessions going on uh, synchronously. So we wanna stick to these starting schedules. But if you have a break, or if you have colleagues who aren't attending the session that you'd like to send the link to, three to five minutes or so, you can uh, uh, see what it's like to do a web-based screening, uh, hearing screening test. And at the very end, we'll reserve 15 minutes or so to review the results that we collected in real time during the symposium and then any remaining time, we will address questions and answers for all of the talks. So uh, I'd like to, um, oh, so I, I also need to read a, an organizational um, a paragraph from ARO. The organizers of the ARO midwinter meeting ask that all attendees adhere to our code of ethical conduct. In particular, we would like to remind everyone that the creation of personal reproductions of any visual or audible aspects of the talks in this session is only allowed for the purpose of increasing comprehension by individuals who may have difficulty understanding the speaker during the initial presentation. Um, uh, there is also a companion web page associated with the symposium at this link. And again, this will be put into the chat throughout um, the symposium. It has a little extra information about the, the content as well as below this content here, a comment section where you can place questions of your own or add comments. And these comments will um, endure past the symposium. If you're inclined, you can also use the Q&A uh, option of Zoom. So the session itself um, came about because we understand as researchers and clinicians that the typical way of doing business today is to have a, an investigator or a clinician working directly with a patient in the same or a, or a research subject in the same physical location. So technology is, is uh, emerging that allows you to break this physical link. And that's something that we'll talk about in this symposium. But also there are additional capabilities that uh, using off the shelf hardware, using advanced algorithms, using experts outside the expertise maybe of experimenters or clinicians, and how we might go about um, exploiting those resources today and what newly on the horizon resources might be available in the near future are also subjects of this symposium. So the goal, our goal is to demystify how you might do this in your work today and also what's coming in the near future. So with that, I will transition into my talk. Again, I'm Dennis Barber from Washington University in St. Louis. And I'll be talking today about a framework of inference that I'm calling self-validating tests, specifically for autometric testing for precision hearing assessment. So what I'll cover is a focus on clinical scenarios of limited inference. Um, several of us will be using the language of clinical investigation, but we believe that a lot of these ideas are general, well beyond just clinical applications to research as well. I'll introduce what I mean by self-validating tests, and I'll clarify their advantages and then give examples for perceptual estimation. So I, I do begin with a clinical example. Um, in 2017, the American Heart Association changed the longstanding guidelines for hypertension. Before 2017, there were three categories of hypertension, a normal range, a prehypertensive range, and a hypertensive range. For various reasons, they eliminated an entire category in 2017, which sounds counter to the trends of precision medicine and big data 
where we expect to have more refined estimates of quantities of interest. So again, there are several reasons for why they did this, but they were all empirical. Here's uh, an investigation leading up to that decision that I found interesting um, and illustrative of the point I'm trying to make. So that, that third category that was eliminated was not predictive for patient outcomes of interest. And this particular study I found interesting because it was it's a, a meta-analysis of large numbers of study populations, nearly a million people. But they still concluded that more data are needed. So their conclusion, we need additional data to try to understand why these measures aren't predictive. American Heart Association's conclusion was, let's eliminate this entire category because it's not predictive. I have an alternate um, proposal, and that is to use the um, data to refine our estimate of the underlying construct of interest, which is we might call cardiovascular health, rather than just um, a single measure, a single biomarker that's measured maybe once a year in a doctor's office. If we instead insert the actual construct of interest into our inference pathway, we're going to be able to do better uh, predictions and do better by our patients. So I break the, the limiting factors of this clinical scenario down into three categories, uh, conflating measurement with the underlying construct. So again, a, a blood pressure measurement is not cardiovascular health. It's a biomarker. It's correlated, but not as highly as we'd like it to be. And relying on just that single predictor, even with large numbers of patients, as we can see, it's not as effective as it could be if we actually modeled the construct itself. And all of that is compounded by the heterogeneity that's in our clinical and our research patient uh, populations, people populations. So I'm introducing um, the concept of self-validating tests. It has familiar and maybe unfamiliar characteristics. And I'm arguing that um, the self-validating test can address all of these shortcomings. So what is a self-validating test? Uh, I'm saying here it results in what I'm calling a probabilistic model of intermediate, uh, immediate observations. And I use that language deliberately. The concept is similar to ideographic models or within subjects or, or um, intra-subject variability models, if you're familiar with those, but it's not, that's not, doesn't capture the full extent of what I'm interested in, in um, conveying. So for this blood pressure example I just used, um, a PMIO in that case would be a model that would predict blood pressure at new observation points. And the reason that's useful for purposes relevant to the symposium is that uh, a predictive model allows us to uh, quantify the predictive validity for new observations. Observations meaning measurements and other non-measurement observations um, immediately while the patient's still in the clinic or while the research subject is still in the lab or while you, while you still have them on the end of a, a website. And new data in, in this framework can either be used to extend the model with additional training or to validate it, to evaluate its quality. And we'll see some examples of that as we proceed. I'll take each of these three limitations and use some analogies to try to um, improve our understanding. In, in terms of understanding constructs, I'm using an example from physics here. Uh, we can't measure mass. There's no sensor that is a mass sensor. Um, so the construct that we typically use to estimate mass is Newton's second law. In this case, with a scale, we assume that the specific gravity field that we're measuring the weight in, um, uh, that we're operating the scale in, is the same as it was calibrated in. And then we just measure weight or force, and we immediately have mass because it's just uh, proportional. So one measurement, but there are assumptions about the, uh, the calibration of this device and the, the, um, the gravity field. An alternate method that uses multiple measurements is a balance. It, it's more general. It doesn't require a specific gravity field. Here we take calibrated weights and we do a series of binary comparisons in an adaptive staircase, heavier than, less than, until we converge on an estimate. And then there's a third opportunity to evaluate uh, mass that's probably not familiar. It's called the inertial balance. Here I'm describing um, an inertial balance that takes elements from each of the two previous examples. We have a construct that is Newton's second law, but now instead of assuming 
the gravitational field or any acceleration, I'm measuring it. So I have a sensor to measure force, and I have a sensor to measure acceleration for this mass in motion. And uh, the, the measurements here, we're still subject to calibration constraints, but it's easier to calibrate uh, a sensor over its entire range on average, rather than a point-wise calibration curve at every single point of the input domain. Um, we still have this construct, only we can accumulate data until we achieve a particular estimation quality, a quality metric, and then terminate our data collection at that point. So what, what this kind of framework does, even though it's a simple construct that uh, these other methods would work fine for in most cases, it makes explicit that we're replacing assumptions with data. So that's the, the main point to make from this example. In terms of over-reductionism, the, the trend for precision medicine generally these days is to take a more detailed focus of the disease and a more detailed, higher resolve focus on the individual and combine them to create a much richer picture of each person. The problem with this scenario is that each of these particular measures is itself independently evaluated and at a pretty low resolution. So here, these are important for this breast cancer example, for example, um, these are um, receptor uh, genetic profiles, but these are still each a binary variable, receptor present or absent. So pretty low resolution and fairly independently considered. Um, here's our example from hypertension. So even though this method uh, succeeds and we'll see examples of success of adding biomarkers together to perform better inference. It has limitations that we'll come back to as well. Um, the synergies between covariates is often lost when you uh, use this type of methodology. And then for the last limitation, um, I have a, a thought experiment here about biological heterogeneity. On the left, I've constructed an example of a dose response, again, using clinical terminology, but I think this is fairly general. So as the dose increases, the response increases in cohort averages. In the middle, I've got a, um, uh, uh, an example where each person gets their own data point. This is an individual differences kind of plot, and now I've regressed the behavior. Uh, each person still only gets one dose and has measured one response, but I have a, a population response across all these individuals that's consistent with what we found with uh, the group dose. However, if we draw conclusions from data such as this of bigger dose means bigger response, which is a reasonable conclusion, these are statistically significant trends. The assumptions that we're making are essentially that the individual models of each person, these blue lines represent these, these uh, predictive models for each person. Either it's the same as this model here of the cohort or the same with an offset. So there's this implicit assumption that uh, there's homogeneity or relative homogeneity in the population to draw a conclusion of that sort. But in reality, these same population data, even the individual differences data in the middle can reflect wildly varying individual um, models, individual dose response curves. So in this example on the left is the most heterogeneous case that's reflecting these data and on the right the most homogeneous. So uh, this this example uh, probably would not be a great conclusion that greater doses lead to greater responses. Um, on average it's true but they're outliers and so the biological heterogeneity um, problem is only really a problem given that we uh, tend to use statistical inference methods that work well under reductionism and homogeneity scenarios in fields like chemistry and physics, but in fields of brain and behavior, like most of us are interested or, or biology more generally, um, reductionism and assumptions of relative homogeneity leave us wanting in terms of inference. So the, the concept of these probabilistic models that we can use immediately have some advantages. This self-validation piece I emphasize in the title of the talk. Again, I think it's relevant as we're looking for more ways to build more complex um, models to reflect more complex constructs. 
that don't rely on assumptions that, that use data to uh, infer quality. But there's a, a very interesting extension that's available and that's to allow for more ecological validity by, by testing more complex things, by bringing confounders into the model. Um, the, and, and we'll see examples of that uh, later as well. The big disadvantage of this kind of uh, procedure or this kind of framework of inference is just, it's data heavy. We're replacing assumptions with data, requires large amounts of data. Typically that's been a, a deal breaker most of the time, but there are two major points I wanna make for this. This kind of framework handles more data better than the uh, traditional cohort level analysis. And the point I'll make in the second half of this talk is that, um, that it, it actually is more efficient to use these methods than we uh, have traditionally thought by exploiting modern machine learning methods. So this top line represents the way I think about our conventional inference and observations meaning data, um, measurements and other non-measurement observations. Diagnostic class could be cohort identity or label. Um, and then we have a predicted outcome that we expect based on our inference so far. The, the problem with this scenario is that each person, no matter how complex these diagnostic classes are, even in the era of precision medicine, each person still only generates one data point for training the model. Um, so the best you can do if you've got a mislabeled person, a false positive instead of a true negative, for example, in the model, is to correct that with more data. So these methods require wide data, a little data from a lot of people to get better. Alternatively, this example uh, here, where we take the same kinds of observations, and if we have mechanistic understanding of disease or of uh, relationships among variables, we can use them to refine our probabilistic models. And these can be either used to make predictions in the future, these outcomes, or to make predictions of observations that can then be used to um, validate the model, evaluate its quality, or update it immediately. So not needing a long-term perspective trial. And the value of this kind of framework is if I have a lot of data from one person, deep data, or if I've got wide data, either one or both, I can exploit to improve the modeling framework and the quality of our predictions. So this is probably the most important point I'd like to make today is that the major rationale for using these kinds of models is that uh, wide data, meaning data from a lot of people, is inherently limited. There's just so many people who are alive or who are sick with a particular disorder, et cetera. But deep data from each person is not limited. It can, it can grow essentially without bound. So here's an example I'd like to pull from critical care medicine, which has really started to adopt many of these ideas. This is a single instrument stream from one patient. It's, it, it's time on this axis and heart rate on this axis. The data points in red are retrospective heart rates the data points in black are prospective. This algorithm is modeling the retrospective heart rates and trying to predict one hour in the future what the future heart rate is going to be. So as new data come along, the model gets updated. This is operating in real time. It's only one data stream and only data from this person. But the goal, uh oh, this is a, a probabilistic model too. So you can see an expected value and a range. The goal is to identify outlying events that might represent a step change in physiological state. So here this has happened, the purple data reflect uh, heart rate measurements that are well outside the range that is predicted by this model. So this algorithm then generates an alert and brings clinicians to the bedside to do a more complete evaluation. So the uh, again, this is something that clinical care medicine is thinking a lot about as a clinical decision support technology that brings in instrumented data streams and labels them according to, in this case, again, we're just looking for outliers for this particular person, but you could bring in other data streams to improve this model, or if you um, apply this framework to multiple individuals, then you can find the time series templates that reflect danger for this patient or potential for a, an adverse event and improve the model for everyone as a result. So it's an example of being able to pull in wide data as well as deep data. Okay, so that's enough of uh, the clinical examples that uh, I wanna bring us to hearing and uh, my thinking about how we can apply these principles today 
And it's because we have, for many uh, behavioral uh, questions of interest, we have a built-in construct that's well established that reflects these PMIOs. And that is the psychometric curve. So we know how um, to map task difficulty to task performance. There's a great deal of theory and decades of empirical results behind this. These psychometric curves represent the probability of getting the task correct as the task gets harder. And they are not observable. They are latent constructs that we cannot measure, just like our example of mass and physics. We can only measure task performance. That's reflected in these black dots. So the theory is great here, but the major limitation is that to estimate one of these requires generally hundreds of samples and is um, traditionally impractical in most situations. What we do perform, uh, because it's so useful to have this information, are uh, reduced estimation procedures. I'm showing here three different staircase designs to try to estimate the threshold, one point on the psychometric curve. And so here's the psychometric curve. Um, staircase designs make the task easier or harder depending on recent performance. And they can converge onto an estimate of this threshold value at, at some particular tolerance. So it's a great method, they're robust, they're efficient, um, but they leave something to be desired when we're thinking about expanding to more complex models. And I can illustrate that once we uh, conceptualize a, a more complex model, in this case, the audiogram. I've spent a lot of effort uh, fleshing out these ideas on the audiogram because it is um, a more complex model, but only slightly more complex than a standard one-dimensional psychometric curve. So here we've got a staircase at one kilohertz. Again, um, the audiogram measures uh, tone detection threshold as a function of frequency. So it's got two input variables, frequency and sound level. And once I achieve this estimate at the end of the staircase, and I think about a staircase at another location, I just don't have many degrees of freedom to use the information I already have to improve this estimate. I start with the same kind of staircase and the same termination criteria again. The way you can conceptualize this a little more clearly is to look at the audiogram and its natural variables. So frequency across this axis, sound level on this axis. Every frequency has a threshold. You can see that kind of reflected in this plot here. This is a screenshot of two different tests superimposed on each other. We'll see the movies that generated the screenshot in the next slide. If I deliver a tone at one kilohertz and get a response from this person, I know more about their hearing at one kilohertz than any other frequency. I don't know much, but relatively speaking, I know more at one kilohertz than anywhere else. So the last place I'd like to go measure next would be one kilohertz. But a standard staircase design applied in this format does exactly that. On the other hand, active machine learning procedures can be designed to optimize data acquisition across this entire space. And what that does then is it um, makes a more efficient yet complete model. So you can see this here. This is the same person's ear, a conventional audiogram on the left, a machine learning audiogram on the right. We'll play these forward in lockstep. You can see that the machine learning audiogram on the right is roving these tones. It's fuzzy at first because I have uninformative prior beliefs. It's a Bayesian method. But as I acquire more data, I get a sharper boundary between where I can perform the task and where I can't perform the task, or where the, the subject can or can't perform the task. So we've, we've spent a lot of time quantifying the efficiency, but the a point I really want to make here is that this is a PMIO. If I'm not convinced at this slope, or I'm not convinced at this region, maybe as a clinician or a researcher, because there's not enough data there, in my view, we can validate right on the spot, because this is a, a fully predictive model, every possible task that we could deliver in this case, I have an estimate of what I expect this person would be able to do with that information. Um, or we can acquire more data to extend the models as well. So the, the reason that, um, or one of the reasons that these PMIO frameworks is um, valuable is it allows us to extend these models uh, without compromising other features of the estimator. So here's an example of what we are calling the um, mutually conjoint bilateral audiogram. 
So we've now extended the model to include the other ear. So instead of a two-dimensional model, it's now a four-dimensional model. We're only delivering sounds to one ear or the other. So it's not, um, it, we're not delivering sounds to two ears concurrently, but we are updating the model of both ears at each time point. And you can see what this looks like here. Again, um, uh, each ear gets a, a tone or not, and the model is updated in each, each ear simultaneously. So the value of doing that, um, one value of doing it is this. So across the population, these disjoint estimates, meaning sequential audiograms one year at a time, consistently take longer to converge to their final estimates than this conjoint estimator. So again, this is, it's two two dimensional models sequentially, but by judiciously exploiting shared variance among our, our input variables, we're able to more rapidly converge by um, incorporating both ears into an admittedly more complex model, but it's, um, we're able to achieve greater efficiencies. And also more importantly, again, for the, the topic of this symposium is that we can extend these models even further to include confounding variables. So here's an example of a cohort of individuals with uh, one dead ear, uh, six individuals, I believe, where a transducer, it, the sounds are delivered, pure tones to the transducer over the dead ear, and detection thresholds are evaluated. And if you're detecting the sound delivery in this configuration, then you're detecting with the other ear. So this is measuring cross hearing or the frequency dependent interaural attenuation of these two different transducers. So there's variation among even these six people. And there's variation in um, both individuals, but also how the transducers are set, et cetera. So there's a potentially confounding factor if someone has fairly asymmetric hearing uh, of this uh, interaural attenuation or this cross hearing. And conventional methods of dealing with this are to add contralateral masking if there's a risk of of um, cross here, or, or, or there's a risk of um, a difference in thresholds between the two ears of being greater than 40 dB. So what we've done is we've extended our bilateral audiogram and include, uh, we've added more higher dimensionality to include this cross hearing uh, interaural attenuation piece. And so what happens, again, we're measuring both ears simultaneously. This region and this particular person represents tones that if, we're, if they were delivered without contralateral masking would be detected by the other ear because of cross hearing. And we're able to show that by dynamically masking in real time, we can eliminate that cross hearing. So to eliminate that confounding variable. And then just to summarize the results here of this particular study in this population, uh, there's a range of hearing loss and a range of asymmetries in this population. The average of all the conventional audiograms conducted by an audiology student is around uh, 14 minutes or so. That includes the individuals who have clinically indicated masking. If you look at all of the, the average time over all of the machine learning audiometry procedures, including the high asymmetry individuals, our uh, time of acquisition is only about six minutes. And then we're hitting all of our target accuracy metrics as well. So this is my last slide. I just want to finish on the note that um, uh, we haven't sacrificed time acquisition for bringing in more and more variables in this case. And I'm extremely optimistic that um, our, generally our goals to leave the clinic or leave the lab and look for more ecologically valid stimuli, scenarios, questions, locations, to interact with our patients and our research participants, that uh, it's practical. That's the main argument I want to make. It's practical to adopt um, modern machine learning methods to pull in um, more complex data streams and still, in reasonable amounts of time, build predictive models of these individuals and then test them. If we are skeptical about the results we're getting uh, with this kind of inferential framework, we'll be able to test in real time whether we got it um, within the tolerance that we're looking for or not. And the last thing I'll mention before transitioning is that uh, the data shown here were all collected from a website. 
So um, it's, it's very straightforward to generalize out into remote data collection. And I think that is a good segue to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Josh McDermott from MIT. And he will be speaking about why we shouldn't be afraid of online psychoacoustics. And I'll remind everyone, if you have questions, feel free to um, place them in the comments section of the associated webpage, whose link we'll, we'll repost uh, in the chat. Um, so I'd like to thank Dennis and Jan Willem for organizing the symposium and inviting me to speak. Um, I'm sorry that we're not doing this in person. This is normally one of my favorite times of the year, um, but hopefully next year, uh, that's what we'll be doing. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you why, um, about why in the meantime, we shouldn't be afraid of online psychoacoustics. Um, so most people are probably aware that over the past 10 to 15 years, crowdsourcing services have become available to connect online workers to jobs. Probably the best known example of this is Amazon Mechanical Turk. So if you're looking for work, you can register with one of these services. And if you've got jobs that you want people to do, you can register. Um, and then you post a job, uh, the workers that want to do it can sign up for the job and do it, and then you pay them through the, the service. So this has been used across a whole bunch of different industries, but it's also been adopted in many areas of psychology. So if you've got an experiment that you want people to do, you can post it, they can do it, and you can pay them. So it enables large samples that can be collected relatively quickly, and so it's become very popular in a lot of areas of research. But it's less widely used in hearing research. I think due to understandable concerns about the lack of control over sound quality, and maybe also concerns of over compliance with instructions. Um, so certainly I think for some kinds of experiments, um, th this is probably not a great option, um, but there are also a lot of benefits uh, to running experiments online, um, especially uh, when in-person experiments are limited. So I think uh, Dennis and Jan Willem asked me to speak in the symposium because um, our lab has been using online experiments pretty extensively for the last seven years. Um, and the overall conclusion that we've drawn from this experience is that for a pretty wide range of experiments, online data collection yields similar results to what you would get in lab, provided that you take some modest steps to ensure data quality. And it also facilitates experiments that would be practically challenging to run in the lab. So the plan for the short talk I'm gonna to give today is to first share with you some suggestions for obtaining good online data quality, um, and then give you a couple examples of how we've leveraged online experiments for our research to get you excited about the possibilities. So our approach for maximizing data quality has got kind of three components to it. The, the first, which is very standard, is to restrict participation to workers that have high approval rates. So if somebody does a job, uh, and it's your job, then you approve them after they've done it, saying that they did what they were supposed to do. Um, and so if you restrict your experiments to people that have approval rates of, say, 95%, um, that, that can be a good starting point. But we also use a headphone check pre-experiment to help ensure sound quality and basic compliance. Um, and then another thing that we usually do is to build in enough trials that a fraction of the data can be used to exclude poorly performing participants without double dipping. All right, so most of us are used to working in no nice normal lab conditions. We've got our sound boost, we've got calibrated headphones. We pride ourselves over controlling exactly what goes into the participant's ears. And clearly, if you're gonna run your experiment online, you're gonna sacrifice some of that. But what we might hope to obtain is a situation like this where you have a person who's listening attentively over headphones. But what could happen and what we would like to avoid is a situation like this where you got a person who's straining to hear over crummy laptop speakers, or maybe even this, where you don't actually have a person at all, but you have a bot that's a part of some fraud scheme um, that doesn't have an auditory system. All right, so we thought that one thing that we could potentially do to help avoid these bottom two scenarios is to use a test that would help confirm that we're dealing with a human that is wearing headphones. So Kevin Woods was a PhD student in our lab who got interested in running online experiments. And he, along with a couple other lab members, had the idea that they might be able to leverage antiphase tones for this purpose. So antiphase tones are frequencies that are 180 degrees out of phase in the left and the right channel. And the idea is that if you are playing this tone over speakers, say from a laptop, well then the two frequencies are gonna cancel partially in the air, uh, reducing the amplitude of the sound. Um, and so Kevin wanted to, to use this phenomenon to design an experiment that would be easy to do over headphones, but not over laptop speakers. So he came up with um, a pretty short six trial experiment for this purpose. 
So on every trial of the experiment, there are three intervals. Each one contains a 200 Hertz pure tone. Um, and one of the tone is six dB softer than the other two tones. And the task of the participant is on every trial to say which of the three tones is quietest, all right? And so the, the sneaky thing that we do without telling anybody um, is that one of the other two tones is antiphase. So the notion is that if, if people are listening to the stimuli over speakers, then the antiphase tone will be the quietest one for the participant. And so they will systematically give the wrong answer. Whereas if they're wearing headphones, um, the, the antiphase tone will sound pretty normal, maybe with some slightly funny binaural effects, um, and they'll be able to get the, the uh, trial correct. So that was a the theory. And then Kevin did some experiments in the lab to try to uh, confirm that this would work as intended. So he ran two groups of participants, one uh, where we knew they were wearing headphones and the other where we knew they were listening over loudspeakers. Um, and this is a summary graph of those results. So this is uh, plotting the number of trials correct that people got under the two sets of listening conditions. And you can see that there's a big peak here um, at six for the people that are wearing headphones. Um, so that means when you're wearing headphones, the task is really easy, which is what's intended. But you can also see for the ones that were listening over loudspeakers, they tend to get zero or one trials correct. So they're systematically below chance, right? So again, we're able to distinguish in, under controlled conditions between these two groups of participants. So what Kevin then did uh, is he ran this experiment on a large number of people using Mechanical Turk. I mean, all of these participants were instructed to wear headphones, right? They have to click a button saying, yeah, I'm wearing headphones. I mean, these are the results uh, from 5,000 people. And so you can see there's a big peak in the histogram um, at six trials, which means there's a good chunk of people that are doing what they're supposed to do. But you can also see there's a second mode of the distribution down here at zero, right? Um, and we think really the only explanation for this, given a whole bunch of control experiments that Kevin ran, um, is that these people are disregarding the instructions to wear the headphones, right? So that's why they're performing below chance. So we have seen um, time and time again um, that uh, under normal operating conditions, about a third of participants generally fail the headphone check. And so they get booted out of, of the experiment. They don't continue on to the main experiment, which you actually want to run. And some of these people are clearly disregarding the instructions to wear headphones. Others may simply not be paying attention. But in both cases, it seems like a pretty good idea to screen them out. Um, and so we've got code available uh, to run this headphone check experiment. So you can use it if you want. And uh, lots of people have done so successfully. So the good news is that um, if you do this, um, we typically find that this uh, brief pre-experiment on its own is often enough to actually give you results that are like what you would get in the lab. Um, this is one example from the work of Melinda McPherson. She's got a post on Wednesday that's got some more data along these lines. Um, here, this graph is showing a replication of tone and noise detection thresholds um, online and with a comparison to in-lab data. So the thresholds were measured with an adaptive procedure. The total duration of the experiment was about an hour. And really, the only screening procedure that's employed here is that headphone check. So these are all the people who passed the headphone check. So she measured detection thresholds for complex tones on the left and pure tones on the right. The dark blue and the black is the online data. Um, and you can see that the mean performance is comparable online and in lab. You can also see the distribution is a little bit wider online um, than in lab. Um, but overall, it uh, looks pretty similar, and, and that was encouraging. We've also managed to reproduce in lab pitch discrimination thresholds. So, this is a result from a recent paper of Melinda's where she was trying to characterize the representations that underlie pitch discrimination. So, the key to this study was to compare discrimination for normal harmonic tones and then inharmonic tones, the, IB, the idea being that the inharmonic tones don't have a coherent fundamental frequency. Um, and so their discrimination must be based on something else. Um, and so th this is a graph that plots discrimination thresholds for the harmonic and the inharmonic tones with and without a three second delay separating the tones. And this is the result. Um, and the, the first thing that I wanna just draw your attention to is that in the kind of the standard condition where there isn't a delay between the tones, we're getting discrimination thresholds that are kind of on par with what you would get from good, good participants in the lab, right? So pitch discrimination thresholds are usually about a percent, right? Um, but this experiment was actually pretty long and grueling relative to a lot of the stuff that we run. So there was a lot of experiments. There were these conditions where there were delays between the tones. So you really had to pay attention. And I think over the course of two hours, the odds are that a per, an online participant is gonna occasionally have some distractions. And so we found that in order to, to match in-lab thresholds, we had to discard about two thirds of the participants. All right? And the key to actually making this work is that Melinda made four threshold measurements per condition and used one of those to determine who to actually include in the analysis. All right? And that left her with three threshold measurements 
which went into the graph here. So you get an unbiased measurement of the thresholds of the people that you include. All right, so that is often a really valuable thing to include this, this extra data that you can use to determine inclusion. Now, the scientific findings of the experiment are twofold. One, when there's not a delay between the tones, the thresholds for these two types of tones are comparable, but with a delay, performance is substantially better when the tones are harmonic, suggesting that there is some memory representation that's specific to harmonic tones. And so we hypothesized that there might be two different representations that people can re rely on when doing pitch discrimination, um, a, a representation of the spectrum when there isn't a delay between tones and then a representation of the F0 when there is a delay. And so to substantiate this, Melinda took advantage of the fact that we got pretty big sample size online, 164 people, and that enables the analysis of individual differences. Um, and that's what's shown here. So this graph is plotting the correlation between the thresholds on pairs of conditions across participants, all right? So the logic of individual differences is that if the correlation is high between two conditions, that's an indication that people are using similar representations in those two conditions. So we've got the harmonic and the inharmonic conditions that uh, we just talked about. And then in addition, Melinda included an interleaved harmonic condition. And so in, th in this condition, the two tones that are being compared don't have any harmonics in common. And so the idea is that in order to make a comparison between those tones, the only real way to do the task is to extract the F0 and, and use the F0 um, to make that comparison. Okay. All right. So we got one condition where you can't use the F0 by hypothesis and one where you, you would have to. So these are the results. And so what she found um, is that the correlation between the harmonic and the inharmonic conditions is high when there is not a delay between the sounds, suggesting that you're using the same representation in those two conditions, but decreases when there's a time interval between the two sounds. Whereas for the harmonic and the interleaved harmonic condition, you see the opposite thing, right? So the correlation is low when there isn't a delay between sounds and then becomes high when there is a delay. So we think this is implicating two different pitch representations depending on the time delay between the sounds, a representation of the spectrum and then a representation of the F0. And this again would have been something that would have been hard to pull off um, in the lab just due to the number of participants. But you might look at this and say, all right, well, this looks a little too good to be true. And I would say, all right, well then let's replicate it. And so that's another thing that the online format really makes easy. Um, so we had another set of 200 participants that did a very similar experiment. And you can see that you get kind of a similar result, okay? And so importantly, like instead of this sort of taking a year of the experimenter's life, this was like another week or two of data collection. So another thing that uh, the large N that you can get online enables is what we call one-shot experiments. These are experiments where you really wanna have the participant do the experiment once or do it conditionally once, because once they've done it, they're kind of spoiled in some way, all right? So in this case, the scientific question we were trying to answer is whether voice recognition depends in part on pitch. And so a natural way to uh, investigate this is to run an experiment where you present voices that are familiar to your participants and then shift the pitch of the voices up or down and measure the effect on recognition. Now the challenges here are that the set of voices that most people can recognize is actually not that big. Um, and then if you're doing the experiment, once you recognize one of the voices, there's a very high likelihood of priming on subsequent trials. Okay? And so the solution that Melinda came up with in this case was to run the experiment online to get a, a large sample size and then to use a design where each participant would hear each voice only once at one of the many possible pitch shifts. So in the, under this design, of course, from every participant, you don't get that much data. And so you really need a big sample size in order to have this be well powered. But you can do this online. You can again see we've got 250 participants. This graph plots percent correct as a function of the pitch shift. So zero is like the natural pitch. Um, and she got this beautiful result, which is that as uh, the pitch deviates from the true pitch of the person's voice, uh, the, the recognizability of the voice declines pretty rapidly. So it's pretty nice evidence that uh, the fundamental frequency is a really important aspect of voice representations. So some other lessons that we have learned from our online adventures, uh, one is that the subject pool is large, but it's not that large. It's not, it's not as large as I actually had thought it might be when we were getting started in this. We think it's maybe a couple thousand at any one time, given the various restrictions that we place um, on participation. Um, it refreshes every few months, um, so that's good. But if you're, you're planning a very large end study, um, you still need to plan pretty carefully. So you could very easily find yourself in a situation where you run 2,000 participants, you realize like you screwed something up about the experiment, and then you can't just immediately go and get another fresh 2,000 participants. And we, we have found ourselves in this situation. Participant quality can also vary over time. Um, so there was a pretty notable increase in fraud over the summer. I think 
due to pandemic related uh, issues. Um, and we saw that our headphone check pass rate actually dropped to 25% at one point. It's, it's since kind of recovered, but this does underscore the need for screening pr procedures. But we have had uh, a lot of success using these methods. This is just a, a list of some of the tasks we've run successfully online. And when I say we've run successfully, I mean that we have replicated in lab results. So I told you about detection and noise, pitch discrimination, celebrity voice recognition. We've also successfully run fusion of musical intervals, judgments of illusory texture continuity, environmental sound recognition, attentive tracking, streaming of melodies, and speech intelligibility and noise. So just to summarize, don't be afraid of online psychoacoustics. Brief pretests can help ensure headphone use and basic compliance with instructions. Performance-based inclusion with independent data can be important for long and grueling experiments, which we often like to run in psychoacoustics. Um, data collection is quick and online experiments enable large N, um, and this can facilitate the study of individual differences, it enables one-shot experiments with few trials for, per participant, and it facilitates replication. So even if you've got an experiment that you're nervous about running online, you can at least try to replicate it online, which might be useful. So I want to acknowledge uh, the fantastic people in the lab that have led all this work. Uh, Kevin Woods got us started down the road of online experiments. Melinda McPherson is our current online guru. Uh, Richard McWalter and Jared Hicks, who has a poster at ARO, also do a lot of this. Um, and many other students have contributed in important ways, as have our funding sources. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great. So moving along, I'd like to introduce Duet Swinnepoel from University of Pretoria, and he'll be speaking on mobile technologies for remote diagnosis of hearing loss. Great, thank you, uh, Dennis. I assume everyone can see my slide. I'd like to just thank all the organizers and especially uh, Dennis, Jan Willem and Dave who are chairing this session to give me the opportunity to share a little bit of the work we've done, kind of continuing along the lines of online um, testing and remote services, but perhaps a little bit more translational and, and how these can be used in a clinical setting. So I'd just like to acknowledge the team of individuals who've been involved with the work I'll be sharing with you today. I'm Karina D'Souza, who is the PhD student, and then the valued uh, co-investigators, David Moore, Kasmitz, and also Armand Mayberg from the University of Pretoria. Also just acknowledge some of the funding sources that have supported this work. And uh, also just acknowledging a disclosure that I'm a co-founder and a scientific advisor to the Eurex group. So maybe just to start off, uh, it may be worthwhile to make a couple of observations on COVID and hearing testing in general. And, and these are just some observations. I like to put up this uh, picture of traditional hearing testing because I think suddenly now a year uh, later, this situation almost seems untenable to, to be able to sit in a confined space uh, with a patient without any personal protection. And uh, the traditional test setup for audiology or hearing testing is just a high risk setup. Uh, it's confined spaces, lots of equipment, and, uh, and, and it's also oftentimes long duration sessions that we have with, with these patients. It's also true that the typical audiology patient is a high risk or, or hearing test patient is, is a high risk patient due to the fact that they're most likely to have age related hearing loss. Uh, they're more likely to be males. And both of those things are, are, are very big risks for COVID mortality and morbidity. But I think some other observations that have certainly transpired over the last year is that there's been a a, a number of changes in perceptions, both in consumers and professionals. So a large consumer survey done, conducted in the UK and the US by the Ericsson um, Mobility Report indicated that six in 10 consumers actually predict now that virtual appointments with the, their physician will become more popular than face-to-face -face, uh, appointments. Professionals have had similar shifts in their opinions. Uh, a survey we conducted with the International Society of Audiology indicated uh, for audiologists around the world that there's been a shift from pre-COVID, 44% of audiologists viewed uh, telehealth as important or very important to their practice. And that's now jumped to 87%. So certainly a big shift due to COVID. And another change that we've seen is that telehealth regulations have now become more enabling. So, so the world has become more uh, accepting of these virtual and remote services. 
So that means that we can really rethink the traditional pathways of care for hearing healthcare and audiology. And, uh, and I think the remote online world offers some alternatives that, that we'd like to put forward in this presentation. The traditional clinic uh, for persons who have hearing loss, and I'm focusing on adults in particular, the aim has been to determine the degree, the configuration and the type of hearing loss at the clinic. And the degree and configuration typically is through air conduction audiometry and the type of hearing loss through bone conduction audiometry. And that's also why a sound treated environment is so important. But if we think in the world we live in now and utilizing uh, remote types of testing, I think a triage approach where we differentiate patients who need different types of care may be a way to actually optimize the, the way in which we provide services. So here the aim might be that we want to determine or the type of hearing loss remotely. So in other words, what is the likelihood that they have a sensory neural hearing loss or a conductive or ear disease related hearing loss? And those have two very different care pathways linked to them. And we could tri triage them accordingly. We we'll know, for example, that sensory neural hearing loss in adults could be assessed in alternative settings that are low and no touch, for example. And the vast majority of the adult patients we're going to see are, are going to be in this category. So if we can optimize care for the majority of them, then we can escalate those who have conductive hearing loss or ear disease or complicated types of conditions to higher touch and traditional clinic settings. So if we think of triage, firstly, with remote types of testing, um, I'm going to be sharing a little bit around the digits in noise test examples that we've been working on. So these may be in the format of a web-based widget and the link that has been pasted on pasted onto the, the chat box um, is to one of these web-based widgets. But it could also be a smartphone application. And I provide two of the examples here. The one is the National Hearing Test of South Africa, Year ZA, and the other is the Year Who application um, that uh, provides a free downloadable hearing test using the digital noise paradigm. So the question is, can we triage care path pathways based on firstly, then screening approaches? And secondly, can we triage through low and no touch types of assessments that may be alternative to traditional test settings? So if we consider triage with remote screening, uh, these are two paradigms that we've been using in terms of our digital noise tests and our um, widgets online and the applications. The first is a dyotic digital noise test. This uh, is an in-phase presentation of the signal uh, binaurally to both ears. And we've shown that it's a rapid test of better ear functioning, mostly representative of better ear functioning. It is insensitive to conductive hearing loss, and it's also insensitive to unilateral hearing losses. And you can see that illustrated on the top uh, figure there as well. We then subsequently used an antiphasic binaural digital noise test paradigm where the signals were out of phase 180 degrees. And this showed up to be a rapid test of poorer ear uh, functioning. It improved our sensitivity to detect sensory neural hearing loss. And it was sensitive to asymmetric uh, or symmetric hearing losses. And it was sensitive to detect conductive hearing loss. So with that information, we uh, constructed a two-stage screening protocol based on the data we had. The first screen is with the antiphasic digital noise test. And if we use a speech recognition threshold cutoff um, to determine normal hearing, those who passed uh, are classified with normal hearing. If they fail the antiphasic DIN, uh, they are then uh, um, triaged to do a dyotic digital noise test. And based on the dyotic test, whether they pass or fail that subsequently, we uh, predicted that we should be able to classify with reasonable accuracy into conductive hearing loss or unilateral hearing loss or into bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. And in this way, through a remote screening, be able to provide some kind of triage uh, for further care for these patients. 
So these are some of the preliminary results um, just been submitted for review. Uh, you can see here um, we have the dyotic on the y-axis and the antiphasic SRT on the x-axis. And we're just presenting two ways in which we're classifying three types of hearing loss, uh, three types of hearing ability. So normal hearing, unilateral sensory neural and conductive hearing loss, and bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. So the first is just a very simple um, uh, division uh, for normal hearing and then into the bilateral and the unilateral sensory neural and conductive hearing loss group. And then we also used a, um, a, a, uh, a tiered uh, approach on the right hand side where we got slightly better accuracy to divide into these cases. So 89% accurate to identify normal hearing, 71% to identify bilateral sensory neural hearing loss, and a 60% accuracy to detect unilateral and conductive hearing loss. So there's certainly some more work that needs to be done there, but it's promising that we can, with these combination of tests, uh, at least with a reasonable degree of accuracy, start to triage these uh, patients. And of course, those with unilateral and conductive hearing losses would be uh, candidates for a high touch type of approach in traditional test settings or medical assessments. If we then come to kind of a, a more diagnostic test approach uh, where we want to triage for low and no touch testing, uh, there is also a need to consider alternative service delivery models uh, according to the required level of care, the risk factors of these patients, and also the cost, the travel and the convenience factor that may also come into play. Um, so it's about differentiating, uh, differentiating patients perhaps in in unconventional or untraditional settings. And those who need further care can then be escalated to those pathways. And, and this is just a simple illustration of a patient who may come uh, into a clinic, but uh, just at the counter side, get a home-based test kit, or they may do a counter side assessment, which is very quick. Um, and then uh, the pathway could be directed from there. So there are different approaches. One way is to use risk questionnaires like the consumer ear disease risk assessment, or in our case, um, to use rapid air conduction tests to differentiate these patients. So these are just findings from a recent um, report of ours where we used air conduction testing, um, did our digital noise test, uh, the diotic version, and we used pure tone air conduction audiometry, both of which can be utilized in non-traditional settings outside of clinics and sound booths. And in this instance, you can see how we differentiated um, sensory neural hearing losses, which is the red dots, and conductive hearing losses, which are the triangles, very accurately using this model. Um, and when we utilized uh, a, a, a linear regression, we had a sensitivity of 97% and 93% specificity to correctly differentiate sensory neural from conductive hearing losses. So a very accurate way in the absence of bone conduction to differentiate patients who may need further care. So this has been implemented in self-test kits for COVID-19, where there's a tablet, a calibrated pair of headphones, and a self-testing uh, uh, sequence where patients can do air conduction peer tone audiometry through these calibrated headsets, either at home or at a counter side or drive through even. And then they do a speechy noise, which is the binaural DIN test. And then the risk assessment automatically classifies based on those test results and some demographics, what their conductive loss risk is. And, and then we can of course also screen for asymmetric screening Oh, asymmetric gearing loss, and uh, we can use red flag questions and an optional CEDRA questionnaire. There's also an additional optional where we can add a digital um, otoscopy that utilizes machine learning algorithm to classify the tympanic membrane images into uh, uh, different diagnostic categories. So in conclusion, COVID-19 certainly has challenged the traditional logical care pathways, but it's also allowed us to innovate. Remote digital screening could support initial triage to direct referrals and to optimize our care. 
Know and low touch care could certainly mitigate the risk, improve safety and convenience and could work for most adult patients with hearing loss. And using these novel tests to triage for ear disease and conductive hearing loss can allow us then to test outside of traditional clinic settings. Next up, we have Jan Willem Wassman from Radboud University Nijmegen Medical Center speaking on hearing assessments freed from time and location constraints. Thank you, Dennis, and good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to um, talk about uh, uh, how you can monitor remotely uh, patients uh, now and also in the future. I'll, ask, I'll start with a more broader picture of the emerging capabilities. I think that's in the theme of this uh, symposium. And then I'll uh, report on uh, a project we're running now at our hospital uh, at home testing uh, in cochlear implant users together with our team, Wendy, Lucas, and Doreen. And uh, if you look at a picture of, uh, can you hear me, Major Tom? I think it's a, a nice example of a listening check and maybe also a, a check of the whole system uh, from uh, 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 Houston, more or less, to the astronaut. Um, but I also like this example because I believe if you're able to perform telehealth in space, you can do it anywhere. And, and, and you can use it, of course, uh, at places that are maybe not easy to reach. Um, well, this is a, a virtual conference uh, this uh, time, and uh, I am a morning person, so well, this is my afternoon, the best uh, moment of my day already passed. Um, and I think there's also different things that we uh, should take into account when we're using remote uh, care. For instance, I assume that the center of gravity of this audience is probably somewhere in the United States, maybe near uh, Missouri. But the perceived distance from you and me will depend more on uh, my distance to the webcam, for instance, and probably my accent, maybe local habits. And these are all things that we should take into account if we are interacting with subjects or, or patients when we do these uh, test, tests. I would also like to use this opportunity to uh, thank uh, our clinical team who have over the last year uh, enrolled a lot of new yeah, technologies uh, to provide care to our patients uh, and also the cochlear team for technical support so that we were able to, to do this in, in cochlear implant patients. And I think there's a, an emerging capability in the sense that we can do measurements right at home uh, in the house of a patient, for instance. And what's interesting then is, are we able to do measurements that can be generalized to real life settings? For instance, this person at the coffee table, is he able to communicate well with his uh, friends and family? And what should we measure to, to, to get an ID? And another thing I would like to emphasize is that we call this remote testing or remote measurements. But I think uh, from the perspective of the patient, these are nearby measurements. And I would like to yeah, challenge the audience for suggestions of how can we better describe this maybe in a patient-centric way. So if you have suggestions, put them on the, on the web page. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And if we look onto what are ecologically valid measurements in hearing science, well, it's uh, measurements that reflect real life hearing related function, activity or participation. And a glance on this picture shows me that this kid is able to actively participate in his uh, classroom. It looks like he's doing well. And these are, I think, performance indicators that we are uh, interested in to know. And we can measure, of course, uh, a lot more than in the past. And here I'd like to uh, use an example from sports uh, and with the wearables that we can use today. I took cycling because I think the differences between the lab conditions and when you're cycling in a simulator or when you're cycling outdoors are uh, small. Um, and to the right, well, you see uh, the ball slants uh, Armstrong. So I, I put him in the center and let's um, imagine he's a patient and instead of a coach, he has a, a care provider or audiologist who's counseling, who's uh, helping uh, this patient. And he has a team around him, uh, in this case, maybe uh, friends, family, colleagues. And yeah, what you want to know is how does somebody perform hey, in real life and what are then the important measures to take? 
and how do they, do they generalize maybe from the lab conditions? And if we are tapping into all these variables, um, yeah, then we have to think about how to manage all these data streams across domains. For uh, we can, of course, focus on hearing tests, but maybe while somebody is performing a test, heart rate might be an interesting measure to know if people are really dedicated to the task, or they might need a different interface due to a vision impairment, or there are other important domains for their health that interact with how they function uh, in, in life. And when you're able to collect these data streams, it also opens up new opportunities, for instance, to explore the relationship between sound and environmental health. And in a recent paper, uh, Dennis and I explain how we think we could yeah, deal with the added complexity if you look onto all these uh, data streams. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into the details. I'll continue uh, to one last uh, important aspect, I think, is that not only we can measure across uh, domains, but we can also test at the time that the patient prefers and maybe do multiple tests. And then a local clinician, somebody accessible for the patient can look at the test, maybe um, uh, provide counseling or maybe administer new tests uh, to get on a better ID. Uh, and while this data is collected, somebody on the background, uh, we call it here a remote expert, but it could be, depending on the case, uh, uh, an expert in uh, autogenetics, or it could be a data analyst who's observing trends and maybe provide uh, better uh, advice or diagnostic for this particular case, or maybe uh, finds ways to improve diagnostics in, in general or therapy. So and now let's go to the auditory athletes uh, of uh, the project we are running. Um, here you see pictures of uh, uh, adults who are doing the test at home that uh, uh, we are uh, uh, well, we're cl collecting data. And so far we have uh, anecdotal evidence that many uh, people with a uh, cochlear implant, they report to me that they're really exhausted at the end of the day or they need time, for instance, when uh, they receive a phone call to tune in a couple of seconds. And it looks like they are using a lot of cognitive resources and maybe uh, top-down strategies where normal listeners would use the fast brain and would be much e for them it would be much easier to to uh, to follow conversations. Um, but we don't know actually what uh, how interventions like a cochlear implant or hearing aids are affecting, uh, for instance, the effect of fatigue. And um, when we're not testing in a, in a sound booth but at home, there might be other effects. Uh, factors affecting the test uh, outcome. Eh? We cannot control for everything that happens uh, in somebody's house. And it might be effects like circadian rhythm, although that we, we know that during office hours, those effects are not so relevant. But maybe if you're measuring in the middle of the night because a patient is stressed, yeah, it might affect uh, the outcome. Or of course, cognitive resources, if people are doing other things while they're doing a test, or if they are uh, fatigued, or if they don't have attention for the test, that might all cause uh, new variability in the tests we do. And um, with the project we are now uh, carrying out, we want to get a better idea of what variability can we expect? Can we maybe increase test accuracy? And is it possible to see trends that you cannot see if you assess a patient only once a year, but that you could see if you measure uh, a couple of times a week or uh, when you measure when you think it's needed? Uh, and what we do know is that uh, core body temperature fluctuates during the day, and it's thought that it's also uh, associated with uh, your performance, your cognitive and physical performance. And uh, for instance, Olympic records are mostly broken uh, at the end of the morning when people are three hours awake. So, of course, uh, we hope that most of the auditory tasks you perform during the day are not that uh, record-breaking, but it gives some uh, insights of uh, how uh, performances fluctuate during the day. Also, for this project we are running, we are interested in what is uh, the long-term fatigue, uh, the chronic fatigue of, uh, of subjects. So what we do is we uh, give them the checklist individual strength, which is a survey consisting of 20 questions, and uh, it's 
reporting the subjective fatigue, concentration, motivation, and physical activity of people. An example question is that they have to reply on a fast scale if they feel physically exhausted, and they need to report over uh, their state in the last two weeks. Here I have some reference data of healthy persons, uh, but also some groups of patients with chronic uh, uh, complaints of uh, chronic fatigue. And uh, while these scores, uh, the reference scores, can be used to assess risk of, for instance, a burnout, if you look at the subscale of subjective fatigue. Um, I don't know exactly what the effects are of age or now, for instance, uh, the lockdown and COVID-19, but of course, changes the routine of people and might also affect these outcomes. Um, for our study protocol, what we do is we administer nine hearing test yeah, batteries actually uh, within eight days. And we assume that the peak in performance fluctuates during the day. And to exaggerate the effects, we have chosen three times to administer the test. Uh, one hour uh, between, uh, within one hour of awakening, uh, the next, the, the, the noon test is when people are at least three hours awake. And the night test is within one or two hours before sleeping. Here you see the schedule um, and day one is always on, on Monday. So people run through this uh, uh, schedule always that Monday they do a complete uh, test and also fill out uh, the survey. And then the next day on Tuesday, they have two measurements uh, in the morning so that we can look into test retest within a session, but also by comparing it to uh, measurements on other days in the morning, we can look uh, uh, what are the effects of test retest uh, between sessions. Uh, and by choosing different moments during the day, we can see if circadian rhythm has effects. Um, and what I said before uh, that we know that's not really an effect within office hours, but well, that's for uh, maybe people with a hearing impairment that's not so severe as in the case of cochlear implant users. So these are uh, some of the assumptions why we think it's uh, worthwhile to do this uh, project. Uh, we do uh, repeated measures uh, ANOVA for looking to uh, statistical effects and will include 50 subjects. Uh, the test battery uh, consists of, as I told you before, the assist survey and the remote check. Uh, the remote check is uh, a monitoring uh, check developed by Cochlear. Uh, you need uh, an, an iOS device, an iPhone or a tablet, then you can uh, take a photo of the implant uh, site um, and also uh, fill out uh, two questionnaires. One questionnaire is including questions from the SSQ. Another questionnaire is more uh, collecting questions like, uh, how was your hearing in the last three months? Uh, are there any uh, unpleasant sounds that you experience? Um, and there's uh, three tests that are performed, uh, a free field audiogram. And this is done by streaming sound from the device to the processor of the CR recipient, uh, a speech and noise test, which is the DIN test. So maybe some of the people in the audience are now familiar with this uh, test and an uh, impedance uh, check. But uh, when we repeat the measurements, we only do the three tests. Uh, people don't need to fill out the questionnaires. And um, at every measurement, we ask people to uh, rate their subjective state at that time. So they have to answer, for instance, how motivated are you to do this uh, test? And directly after the test, they have to answer uh, how they rate their listening efforts and also if they wanted to uh, give up, because we think that's uh, a proxy for uh, listening efforts. So what have we learned so far from uh, this project? Uh, we see that multiple tests a day is possible uh, for this group. We can also do this assessment uh, totally uh, virtual by also starting with uh, instructions via email. Uh, we used WhatsApp a lot for giving instructions. Um, the CIS seems sensible, uh, sensitive to measure chronic fatigue. Um, and what I want to share is some constraints that we are experiencing. For instance, digital proficiency is really important. Uh, uh, one example is that uh, one subject had problems, couldn't uh, get through the test and I asked, well, could you maybe uh, make a screenshot and share this with me? And then I got a question, what's a screenshot? So we had to first explain this. And with some uh, 
patience, I think it's all possible. People can, can learn this, of course. And, uh, and you really have to yeah, see sometimes through the eyes of, of the subject what they are doing to see what's going wrong. But that means we also learn a lot. And I think this uh, helps also to uh, alleviate some of the technical constraints. Uh, so far, another constraint is that we can only use iOS devices. And um, yeah, I hope that in the future, so far we have tests in a sound booth and that's the, the golden, gold standard. But if every brand uh, or company would have his own standards on how to stream uh, tests, it will be hard to compare, of course, between different groups of subjects. So I think that will be things to consider in the future. Um, so that's my talk on this uh, project so far. Uh, if you have uh, projects you want to share, uh, well, you can use the, the website we're promoting. And I would like to announce already the second uh, virtual conference on computational audiology that will be organized by Tobias Goering and his team from the Cambridge uh, Hearing Group and we'll uh, follow soon with uh, more announcements. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Jan Willem. So moving on to keep us on time, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Elle O'Brien from Iterative AI and University of Michigan School of Information. She'll be presenting on building infrastructure for machine learning and big data and hearing science. And so um, what I'm gonna talk about is, is really zooming out quite a bit from what we've heard today. Um, and my topic is building infrastructure for machine learning and big data in hearing science. And so what this means, first I'll, I'll share a little bit about my background and how I got to this particular topic is that I did speech and hearing research. I did my, my PhD in speech and hearing sciences at the University of Washington. And after that, instead of postdocing, I joined an open source um, software project that works on extending Git version control, which is a way of you know, managing versions of software projects. Um, extending that to data science and machine learning. And um, in one week, I'm joining the University of Michigan School of Information as a lecturer and research investigator. Um, and something that was really shocking to me that I learned when I, when I kind of transitioned into industry briefly was that data scientists don't spend their time on any of the activities that I really thought. I really thought it was gonna be all about, you know, using the experimental design knowledge, you know, that you might have or the statistics. And the majority of it really seems to be in loading your data, cleaning your data, understanding your data. Um, and, and this seems to be pretty consistent. There's been a number of large scale surveys that you know, are establishing this, and this is across many types of organizations, but where there's large data, data is its own technique. It really requires a, you know, a specialized skill set for managing it. And I'm imagining if we were to you know, spend time at a big data lab and by a lab using big data, you know, there's lots of ways that could be used, but basically all the projects that we've heard about today have substantial streams of incoming data. You know, it's, it's beyond the scale that you can, you know, manually enter into a spreadsheet or that you want to be manually inspecting. Um, so you have real needs for quality control. Um, you want some things to be automated. You can't understand your data by looking at a spreadsheet anymore because it's going to be quite high dimensional and possible possibly too large to load in some cases. Um, and so, you know, I'm the reason why this seems to take up so much time and which I think will become a kind of a just a natural law of working with data that all labs that go this way are going to have to contend with is that bigger data is it introduces more complexity. Um, and so the Netflix data science team, um, they have an open source project too around how they manage their data science flow. And they have this quote that I like, from experience, we know that much of the pain related to operating modern machine learning system, machine learning infrastructure is caused by the complexity of large scale distributed systems. And by distributed, I mean this in a very general sense of many computers, many team members, many stakeholders, and many parts. And so I wanna step through you know, a couple of the ways that complexity occurs in you know, presumably the kind of work that we might be undertaking if we follow these methods. Um, you know, part of it is that we've always had some complexity. Anytime you have a data set, you know, and you derive some analyses from the data set and then you publish the analyses, 
you have some, you know, complex dependencies, you've still got to manage, you know, your, the computers in your lab, you've got to make sure that you have the software, the hardware, but we can often get away with hackier solutions when our scale is small. So we can get away with, you know, we manually entered our data in a spreadsheet and we just copied over, you know, the results and we wrote it in a, you know, a Word document, or we didn't version control things because of there's only a couple of us working on this and we have backups and that, you know, you can do that quite a lot, you know, at small scale, but the larger your data gets, the more computers, the more, you know, platforms that are involved, like whether you're doing mobile web development, um, you know, you, you have to, their debt will accrue very quickly if this isn't kind of handled in some intentional way from the start. So some forms of complexity. One is data provenance. So an easy example is that there's, you know, in any lab ongoing data collection. Um, so for example, I, I recently, I'm working on a, a project where we have new data rolling in every single day, and it can be thousands of, thousands of new measurements every day. So in a few months or even a day, my today's data set will actually be the old version. Um, and so if your data set is changing over time, at any point, the analysis that I do on that day has to be linked in some kind of immutable record to what data set gave me this analysis today. Otherwise, in a couple days, you have no idea what data set your analysis came from, even if it's really from the same table. Um, you know, another example going beyond just adding data is that maybe you'll have some raw data and then you'll do some pre-processing. So maybe you will low pass filter, you know, some data and then you'll aggregate measures within a subject. And then maybe you publish it and another lab takes it and transforms your data in an entirely new way for their analysis. So this is an example of how a data set can be derived from a previous data set. So I could take data from a previous, you know, from like a public data set and then transform it in some way. And so my new data set and what I make with that depends on the data I accessed as well as how I transformed it. Another example is um, pipelines. If you're kind of more on the mathematical side, you might call this a directed acyclic graph. And it's how a bunch of functions chain together to get you from raw data to a result. And I really particularly see this in neuroimaging labs where, you know, you have a lot of cleaning steps, but this will also just happen, you know, if you're taking large psychophysical data off of, you know, uh, off of an app or MTurk, you're still going to have to go through like a quality control stage and aggregation stage, et cetera. And then maybe at the end, you'll model. Um, and modeling could be as simple as, you know, you have a hypothesized model and you're going to test it, or it could be something like we're really doing, you know, a search over a large model space for the best model. Maybe it's prediction is the goal. Um, but in all of these cases, you've got a bunch of functions that are chaining together that transform your raw data to some kind of result. Um, and in machine learning, especially when we're going for prediction, you will really often go over this cycle several times. This is kind of an iterative process. You say, ah, this didn't work so well. Maybe we've really got to include a different feature. Maybe we want to reduce dimensions first. Um, so there's really an iterative process here. Um, so one solution for you know, both of the two kind of complexities that I've shown you is version control. Version control is a tool for tracking changes in your work. So for example, it's like you'll just take a, a snapshot of what your work is at all these points in time. Um, so you can always go back to it um, without version control. You, this, is, this is what happens if you don't have version control, you get all of the you know, ending suffixes of final version two. Um, so I've definitely been there. Um, version control systems, Git is the big one, there's others. And GitHub, which I see some of these labs are using is a really nice place that you can host Git projects either privately or publicly. I had a, a pretty good experience in the lab where I did my dissertation where it was a, a lab convention that we would all post all of our code on GitHub. But as I learned, that was I thought that was pretty good and it is a really good first step, but it's nowhere near what it takes to actually reproduce all of the work of an experiment. Um, and that's partially because of this other kind of complexity, which is software dependencies. So uh, I know a lot of us have had the particular headache and heartache of when you make something in MATLAB and it's your version and then you send it to your colleague and then they actually have the older version of MATLAB and then it doesn't actually run out of the box or maybe the paths are coded in a way that works for like Linux or Mac, but not. 
anyway, the gist of all the things I was summarizing is that we're in this kind of delicate balance of reproducibility and complexity. Complexity is that we have ideas that we want to test out really quickly. We have evolving codes and data sets. We have software and hardware dependencies. Hardware dependencies for a hearing science lab can be quite substantial, especially in times when we're all going into the lab and it's, you know, all the equipment that you use, it's your sound cards, it's, it's your, any machines that you use, it could be EEG, eye tracking machines. Um, but even, you know, even in web and mobile development for what kind of things that we're showing here, there's still not, you know, there's still something. Um, and the complexity of being able to explore multiple modeling approaches. So kind of like in Dennis's talk about how, you know, we're really exploring a very high dimensional space of possible models with many possible predictors taking many possible values. And on the other hand, we have reproducibility, which is the ability to repeat your own work, but also to share it and give it to a colleague and enable them, you know, to basically run everything you did. So to be able to have them recreate the software environment, the hardware environment, so it's really trivial for them to take your code and your data and rerun it and make something new with it. Um, and that goes hand in hand with ease of collaboration. And, you know, I think the whole of science, you know, is still taking its first steps, I think, to getting there um, because it's still not trivial, you know, when we publish something, it's still not trivial to really pass off everything I did and make a colleague, you know, able to understand every step and build on it. And there are so many tools out there. And I thought at first about going in a very practical way here and kind of talking through some of the tools. There's inversion control, there's Git, and the team I work on data version control is just extending Git a little bit for bigger files. Um, computing infrastructure, it's trivially easy to get compute now. I, I don't want to, it's trivially easy from a technological side, but the interface is not that easy. And part of why this is still hard, I think, for labs to get into is because of, you know, it's not super easy to start using cloud computing. There is a learning curve. Um, dependency management, so packaging up all of the software that's needed to run your software. Um, and there's tools for automated code and data testing too. But I don't think that the tools are really the problem. I think there are lots and lots of tools out there and we could have workshops all day about, you know, which tool is right for you, um, how do we use them? I, I think that it's really an infrastructure problem and in part how we design labs and we design teams. So, you know, this has been an ongoing, like everything I'm talking about is a huge issue in every organization that works with data. Um, and it's, it's kind of an infrastructure question. So part of it is, you know, how do we develop expertise within our own community? So how do we make sure that there's a community of, you know, there are some people that really understand how do you build a mobile app for testing hearing, and they understand the science of psychophysics too, and that they can, you know, lead on that, you know, lead and grow that expertise. So ensuring that we're investing in that approach, you know, as almost the way that you might study like microscopy or you might study EEG, maybe there's, you know, I think the complexity of developing these kind of tools is now at that stage where I, I think it can be its own postdoc or PhD. Um, and some of the techniques here that I think are important are people who understand where cloud computing fits in web and mobile development and data engineering long-term research engineering roles. So almost every data science team at you know an organization that works with large data has an ops team too. There are people who just support the engineering that goes into having large data sets. Um, some of this is shared resources. So how do we make data sets you know, public and shareable? Or even if we're not going to make them all the way public, but easy for collaborators in some kind of, you know, browser based, you know, just a way to host them in a way that people can access them. Um, how can we share our software tools and even computing power? And there's a couple scales that are worth thinking about. So across labs that are collaborating, departments and research hubs. And I think these kind of have to be community decisions about, you know, what are the priorities and what's most important to start, you know, creating some shared resources around. And also community design standards for data and model sharing. So I'm seeing in 
um, particularly in neuroimaging communities, because of that, they've had to contend with large data for quite a while, um, that we're starting to see some standards come up about, you know, these are the fields that we're going to use when we store a data file from EEG or MRI. Um, so that way, anybody anywhere who works with this kind of data can take it and they don't have to like understand, you know, what does each column mean? It's kind of standardized. Um, so that's an ongoing effort. And, you know, we'll, we'll watch and see how that goes and maybe learn something from it. Um, but, you know, if there's a kind of data format that's used across many labs or many research groups, this, you know, getting into ways to share data and model and agreeing on conventions can reduce some of the complexity that individual labs and research groups have to handle. So I guess I don't have any, you know, a, a practical solution other than to say this stuff is really hard. Um, and I think I just want to say we need to know about it at this point. And if we know about it now, I think that'll make us a lot better equipped to handle it as we explore, you know, the scientific capabilities of the methods that we've seen today. And so my questions are, how will we embrace the emerging capabilities in hearing research that we've seen today? And how will we incentivize doing it really well? Um, and so this is my contact and happy to answer questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Elle, especially for bouncing back so quickly from our technical difficulties. Um, we are pretty much on time. Uh, I want to encourage everyone, especially uh, young investigator students who are on the symposium to post your questions either in the Zoom chat or in the accompanying webpage. I'll post that link again briefly. We're entering the last segment of the symposium. So I'll introduce the speaker. This is Dave Moore from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So um, I'm going to present a, something here to finish off, which is very orthogonal to several other talks we've heard this morning. And I'd like to thank everyone for sticking with us. And I want to put a particular call out for people who are outside the Americas and having to uh, work under very difficult time schedules for <laughs> attending these uh, sessions today. So my particular uh, shtick here is to talk about linking hearing and other data in large populations. And so it draws on a lot of the, the big data issues, which Al was just mentioning there, and also remote testing issues that have been taken up by a, a couple of other speakers. Um, the people I've listed here are just some of the people who've been involved in the, um, the work that I'm going to talk about today. I'll call some of them out specifically at relevant times. And across the top, we've got some of the funding organizations and two of the uh, places where we've been doing this big data work, uh, UK Biobank, which I'm particularly going to focus on in this talk, and 23andMe, which is kind of a marker, but um, we're about to have a data release from over 200,000 participants in 23andMe who've done an online hearing test. So with that appetizer, I'll move on to talk about my uh, different things. So big data is a, a concept that's been around for roughly 20 years or so now, and uh, was originally um, defined as large volume and wide variety of tests with um, high velocity input of data, as we've heard about. But um, more recently, it's gone over more into predictive behavior analytics, uh, where we're interested in correlating different aspects of function often across very different systems. So many of you will be familiar with the traditional surveys of hearing that have been done um, at a national level. For example, the NHAN study here in the US um, has provided data for a, a whole cornucopia of, uh, of studies, particularly in auditory system. Uh, and the I should mention the English longitudinal study of aging, which is uh, uh, a much smaller sample size, but one that's uh, enabled some causal connections to be developed, for example, between cognition and hearing aid use is a, uh, a very interesting recent paper by Piers Dorr and his colleagues. Um, the Beaver Dam study in uh, Wisconsin, which uh, Karen Cruikshanks has, and her colleagues have published a lot of work on. And finally, the Blue Mountain study in my native Australia where um, again, we've had uh, a number of uh, papers in the auditory domain. 
Now, all of this was kind of blown out of the water somewhat by the human genome product, which took place between 1990 and 2003, when the first uh, uh, blueprint was laid down for the human genome. And of course, that raised the, the huge stimulating possibility that we might be able to combine hearing data with um, genome data. And, and indeed, that's something of what I'm going to be talking about today. So in UK Biobank, which at the time it was launched, uh, was the largest medical experiment ever done, um, did in fact um, give a series of tests, and I'll, I'll talk more about UK Biobank in a moment, but uh, it particularly combined hearing with genetics, as has 23andMe, and um, the US uh, Veterans Program, which has um, up to a million participants in different aspects of the study. And we've heard um, from a couple of the speakers this morning about continuous data gathering, which I think is kind of the, the new generation of these sorts of uh, things. And I particularly wanted to draw your attention to a, a really wonderful paper by Poppy Crum that was in IEEE Spectrum in 2019. And the, the reference for that is on the, the website that Jan Willem has mentioned and, and others have. Um, its title is, hearables will monitor your brain and body to augment your life and um, using devices tucked in, into your ears to make technology more personal than ever before. And uh, the particular aspect I wanted to mention of this, of course, is the relationship between hearing and other aspects of function. So turning to UK Biobank, um, it's a research resource for the whole world. And it's important for listeners to this to know that although this was collected in the UK, it is available for any researcher in the world. You can make an application, you can go to um, UK Biobank, just Google, it'll come up. And here we have a, a word cloud describing the sorts of connections that have been made with this resource. Uh, it consisted of uh, over 500,000 middle-aged people between the ages of 40 and 70, of whom I'm a participant as well as a, an investigator. And uh, you can see this little figure down at the bottom left here showing some of the different things it was looking at. And uh, if you look up the top here, there's one pointing to the head saying cognitive function and hearing tests. And these were the only uh, tests of uh, neurological function, which were actually uh, where quantitative data were collected from object objective observations. Um, and as I've outlined briefly, um, a real highlight of UK Biobank has been um, the genotyping data, uh, which has been available for some time since July 17. And a new development just this year, uh, I should say last year, has been whole genome sequencing, which by the end of this year should be available for 200,000 of these participants. So here's a, a bit more about it here. The hearing side of things, which I'm really going to focus in on now, consisted of a digits in noise test. And uh, Devet has introduced that briefly, but I'll come back and say more about that in a moment. Look at this sample size here, 185,000 people have taken this test. And uh, also questions about hearing, of which there were 10 in this case. And uh, that's being taken bet of, um, between 170 and 561,000 people. Um, the, those tests were all repeated on smaller samples um, about and up to 10 years after the baseline assessment and cognitive testing, which is particularly um, gaining ascendance within the auditory community has followed a similar trajectory and which can now be um, compared with the auditory data as we'll see shortly. And finally, I want to mention MRI, which is another new addition to the UK Biobank, uh, which started about six years ago now. And thus far, around 50,000 people have had follow-on tests at two years after their initial um, MRI. We've got data on about 3,000 people. And at all of these test periods over a a total duration of about 16 years now, we have repeat measures of hearing testing, the questions about hearing, and the cognitive testing. 
So we've really got a wonderful resource here. So I'd like to run you through very briefly um, a paper that's uh, also mentioned on the website by Helena Wells and her colleagues. And this was a, a collaboration mainly between University of Manchester, where I work part time, and uh, King's College London, um, where Frances Williams and her colleagues are based. Uh, Helena is a, was a PhD student at the time. So here's the design of the study. We've got the UK Biobank hearing difficulty data. So these were simply two questions about hearing. Do you have any difficulty with your hearing? And do you have difficulty following conversation if, if there's a background noise? And um, the age was greater than 50 for this particular uh, section. And here's some of the results shown in a Manhattan plot. And um, some of you, will probably be unfamiliar with this sort of plot, but essentially it's looking at all the chromosomes and um, where uh, a particular gene goes above this red dotted line for either the hearing difficulty or using hearing aids, this is a significant result. And as you can see, there are approximately 40 uh, genes that were uh, identified here, some of which were common to both um, hearing difficulty and the use of a hearing aid, and some were not. And um, of these 40, uh, seven were completely novel gene discovery, which could be made uh, with great facility when you have such a large sample size. Uh, and that work is published, as I said. So coming back to the hearing test, we've already heard about digits in noise, and I'll just very quickly run through it with you. Here we see a typical participant in the studies see in front of a touch screen, wearing standard phones. And this data was collected in 23 centers across the, the UK, a very good sample, which was very carefully monitored to try and equalize demographics and so forth. And it consists of three spoken digits in steady digit shape noise, uh, an adaptive staircase of 25 trials, which takes about three minutes to do per ear. Um, it's internet deliverable, as we've heard. Um, you don't need a sound booth, mainly because the noise that's presented actually uh, masks environmental sounds. It's also very tolerant to use of different devices, which we've heard about today, an important issue. And um, it's usable by very young children and old, very older adults because it's cognitively relatively undemanding. And we can try it, as we've heard several times at, at the website. So here are some uh, kind of funky results between hearing cognition and age that are now a few years old, but I love showing them because when you're working with so many people, you get these amazing data relationships that are um, almost perfect. And if you can see a difference between the different curves here, it's because that is a real difference all of these things are statistically significant. And in fact, when you're working with these sort of huge data sets, significance almost goes out the window because everything's significant. What you have to look at is effect sizes. And in this case, we're looking at the speech reception threshold, which is a measure of uh, hearing ability on the digits in noise as a function of age. And over here, we look at the distribution between the speech reception threshold on this y-axis and cognitive composite decile where 10 is the highest level of cognitive performance and one is the lowest. And you can see there's a very strong relationship even in this very simple test between cognitive performance and age. Um, males and females represented in blue and pink, sorry for the traditional approach there, um, performing relatively similarly across this. Um, and you can see that at each age, people in the very lowest cognitive uh, deciles were having particular difficulty with this task. And uh, I like to summarize these data by saying that a very cognitively able 70 year old has the same level of speech and noise hearing as a very uh, cognitively unable 40 to 49 year old. So it's a good relationship seen there. And just by comparison, using another large whoops, using an, another large data set, the uh, in AH toolbox, this is the uh, same relative relationship for pure tone audiometry. Um, here you can see clearly the females are doing better than the males, 
uh, across all things, but you can also see that even for this very simple test, there is a relationship to cognition. So I'd like to finish just with some future work. Uh, for, currently, we're trying to persuade UK Biobank to conduct further online testing, <coughs> excuse me, because we need to improve sensitivity and to do further longitudinal analysis. Secondly, we want to harness the power of the whole genome sequencing, which is currently underway. Um, we'd like to look at other types of phenotypes, for example, tinnitus, which are not currently available in detail. And I should say that the 23andMe sample, which is about to be released, had 50 hearing questions altogether. So there's a lot of potential there for power. And finally, I'd just like to say that the combination between hearing testing, genetics and imaging releases unparalleled power for human auditory science. And I'd strongly recommend people um, to go to the, the resource with UK Biobank um, and use it if they can. And bear in mind that the NIDCD at last inquiry at least strongly encouraged people to use existing data sets you don't have to go to the expense of doing your own experiment when there's all this wonderful data already available. And finally, if you haven't done it already, you've still got a couple of minutes to go to computationalaudiology.com to do the demonstration digits in noise test. So thanks very much for your attention. And I'm gonna pass back to Dennis to organize the Q&A session. Thank you, Dave, and thank all of our presenters. Uh, I, we have 10 minutes in the symposium. Many of our questions have been addressed in the Zoom chat and some on the website. So I'd like to start with the remainder of our time and maybe pass the torch over to Devet to discuss the results. We, we have results of our real-time hearing test experiment. We had a good uh, part they partake of the digital noise test demo. I'm not sure if that's a reflection on how engaging our talks were, um, but we had 61 people completed um, by 6, well, by the, on a half the hour, it's 6.30 p.m. where I'm at. I know it's morning where most of you are. So let me just share quickly with you some of the results. So this is how the results end up in the, in the back end portal. And you can see which ones fail and pass. Just to give you an illustration of, uh, this is an example of someone who passed their uh, screening test, their birth year and their signal to noise ratio is illustrated there. You can also see the 23 steps of the test and, and how they responded. There's another example of someone who failed the hearing screening with a signal to noise ratio of um, uh, minus 0.4. Um, and you can see in this instance, the birth year was 1933. And then uh, we do an export uh, on Excel. So I have a wonderful research assistant, which is also the PhD student, Karina, who assisted uh, in exporting this for us. And here are the final set of results. So 61 participants uh, who did their digital noise test during the session. So you can see this correlates the speech recognition threshold on the y axis to age on the x axis. And um, uh, there were 26 fail results. And in all likelihood, uh, the high proportion is due to the fact that most people probably did not use headphones or earphones. So probably just a, a free field speaker on their device. And, and that does lead to slightly elevated uh, SRTs. And I think it also speaks to the point that Josh made so eloquently about having potential checks to make sure that people are actually wearing their headphones, you know, during these kinds of online um, tests, especially when it's for research purposes. In most instances, uh, these uh, widgets are used for, by consumers or patients or clients, so they're usually motivated to actually do it correctly. Um, unlike participants uh, necessarily in a, in, a, in a ARO session. But in any case, I'm going to I'm going to leave that there. Um, uh, thank you for everyone for participating uh, in the interactive nature of this presentation and actually conducting this test. Great, thank you to that. And I agree. I think um, uh, if anyone wants to navigate to the DIN webpage that has those results as well there. 
I would say in the remaining time that we have, we accept questions from the audience. Um, we still have a few for, from the later talks unresolved. So maybe I will read those out and allow the uh, presenters to address them verbally. So we have one question. Uh, Dave, you might want to ask UK Biobank for balance data as well. For example, the CVIMP data. And I see Dave is, is typing a response to that. Yeah, I am typing a response and uh, there are balance data in there. And I, I was about to suggest to uh, Tilak, the, uh, the asker, that he actually registers for UK Biobank and looks up the data himself. So, Dave, can you address whether there's a cost to researchers accessing the UK Biobank data? Yeah, there is a cost. It's relatively modest, I think, in the order of a thousand dollars or so, um, and that gives you um, access for several years and across, um, I think, a, a number of workers at one site. So it's a site license, essentially. Oh, excellent. So investigators might be able to join forces with other collaborators at their home institution to get Correct. Access. And in fact, uh, that's what we did in the UK. Initially, I was in Nottingham at the time and we joined forces with Manchester. And then, as I mentioned, in the context of the genetic data I presented uh, with uh, King's College London, they strongly encourage that. And one of the first things they do when you make an application is um, bring to your attention the other groups who are interested in the same sort of domain. Great. Thank you. Next question for L. I'm guessing there are some cultural elements and it can be difficult in speech and hearing departments to leverage limited funding for these open science, big data type pushes, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm having so a couple of like back and forths here, which are, are really good um, about, you know, it's, it's, there does seem to be a real kind of cultural issue. And that's kind of where I didn't want to focus on tools so much is because of there's a real shift into saying this is a priority and we have to fund this and we have to invest in people learning these skills and they can't be an afterthought if we want to scale the data collection this large. And it's like, it, it's, you know, right now, most people I know that are really good coders, it's like they were passionate about it and they wanted to learn it and that's how they got there. And so, you know, it seems like there's still a lot of room to grow and it's not clear, you know, because some fields like um, in neuroimaging and parts of psychology, I think they've been putting a lot of effort into this. Somebody else commented about um, the human brain mapping. I, I know I'm butchering the acronym, but it stands for something with human brain mapping um, organization. And they uh, they have had a lot of open science initiatives. And you know why we haven't seen it here is a really interesting question, which you know if people have ideas about, I'd love to hear because kind of knowing what are the barriers is you know the first step to figuring out how we get over them. My hunch is that some of it has to do with the heterogeneity of people who work in hearing science, that there's a lot of people with a lot of different priorities coming to each research project, that you have clinicians, you have scientists, and you have people in various phases of their training, which are going to go into different sectors after that. And so that, you know, is really an asset and a strength. And it also makes it harder to make shared conventions about how we develop, how we access data, how we manipulate data. Um, it's, it's both a real strength and a challenge for that. Um, but I'm very curious what other people think about this. I, I would personally echo those sentiments that most of us in this panel have our feet in other disciplines as well. And we're seeing movement in other spaces. And that was actually the, the inciting idea for holding the session. <clears throat> we feel that it's time in speech and hearing sciences to pull in some of the already vetted procedures and then also looking forward to the future in our field um, for advanced methods like this. Okay, uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Another one for L. it may be a lack of awareness or education within the field um, that those practices exist. So uh, reflecting uh, the conversation we just had, the benefits and the benefits they provide. The Journal of Ear and Hearing recently added some open science policies to encourage these practices, but they're fairly new. So it sounds like the, um, the publishing, the publishers are in, in speech and hearing are uh, beginning to consider policies that reflect open science, big data, uh, collaborative initiatives, et cetera. Okay, um, let me move on to a question to Dave. Does UK Biobank have cognitive health or mental health data in it? Uh, yes, 
<laughs> it certainly has cognitive health because that was what I reported in my talk um, about uh, that was actually uh, collapsing down six different cognitive tests. And since then, they've added additional cognitive tests um, in some of the follow-up work. Uh, on the mental health side, uh, we've also done some work relating hearing to um, other uh, mental health issues, including schizophrenia and We've looked at tinnitus and depression and and so forth. It's very easy to make associations uh, across these fields using these large databases. And um, so much so that uh, the collaboration with Manchester um, has resulted in almost 20 papers so far uh, since the data were first released six years ago. Okay, I'm going to wrap up now with a, a comment and a quick question. So Roger Miller from uh, NIDCD has posted uh, to reach out to him if you're interested in seeking funding from NIDCD for big data archive and machine learning activities. I think that's, a, that's an incredibly important public service announcement for this community. And there's one last question to me actually about um, prediction modeling and can it be extended when the outcomes of interest are speech intelligibility, for example, digits and noise. That's absolutely the case. That's where the research is right now. So the audiogram was our test case to demonstrate that we could achieve the effects that we wanted without sacrificing the time, without taking a long time. But we've built now cognitive models and uh, visual perceptual models. It, it works in a wide variety of, of contexts. Okay, I feel like um, we succeeded in our goal of presenting this material. I think uh, my fellow organizers, the presenters and the audience who, if, if you stuck with us all the way to the end, uh, kudos to you. And a special thanks to those of you who took time out to perform our online DIN test. That concludes this symposium. I wish you all um, an excellent remainder of your ARO virtual experience.